Thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Harry, and the rest of the team for having me here. I'm going to cover in the next few minutes some updates on Lona Farnab, uh, PEG Lambda, and just talk about how this late stage development is moving forward. My disclosures are on my website. Just want to highlight some key points that there's been a number of phase two studies with Lona Farnab and also with Lambda interferon, including the lower one through four. These patients were dosed with lonafarnib with or without ritonavir, with or without PEG-alpha-2A. Data results from these phase two studies resulted in a phase three study design, which I'll discuss at the middle and end of this presentation. Also, we'll go over the phase two lambda interferon uh, studies. So the Delta virus is very interesting. It depends on the hepatitis B virus, specifically surface antigen. And it requires this uh, through protein prenylation, although there's some controversy because there's been one recent uh, basic science paper that showed that Delta could actually be packaged using hepatitis C, dengue virus, and um, or vesicular stomal virus. So it, whether this is strictly hepatitis B dependent still is not clear. We think about 6% of hepatitis B patients are co-infected with Delta globally. This is a number that's also relevant, we think, to North America. And of course, it has very rapid disease progression, and we really need uh, FDA or regulatory approved therapies uh, globally. Rapid progression, the rule that we use is about 70% will develop cirrhosis and potentially further complications, including liver cancer, within uh, uh, 10 years, or maybe even shorter, as uh, short as five years. This rapid progression was modeled in a couple of different studies with co-infection showing that up to 100% of patients can actually have cirrhosis uh, over a 10-year period. Two papers by Dr. Fadovich. The survival of Delta looks similar to stage three colorectal cancer or resected non-small cell lung cancer. So again, highlighting the uh, urgency of uh, uh, developing new therapies. So lonafarnib is a small molecule. First in this class, it's a prenylation inhibitor that blocks farnesyl transferase. Been well characterized in a number of phase three studies with over 2,000 patients dosed in oncology programs. There is some dose limiting toxicity, which is a class effect, GI toxicity. This is the reason for the ritonavir boosting and interaction with cytochrome P450. As an orphan designation in the uh, US and EU, breakthrough designation and prime designation as well. And there's patents covering this in a number of places throughout the world, uh, including with ritonavir dosing and duration. This gives you some data on the phase two uh, program and also comparison to uh, the PEG interferon alpha 2A arm from the MIR study that was presented by Dr. Wiedermeyer. Thing I'd like to highlight here is that all three of these uh, arms, uh, two specifically in the lonafarnib, ritonavir, and triple therapy, were using the robogene uh, assay. So I think it's very important when you're presenting uh, data is to actually give the uh, assay and also give the limits of detection of that assay. And of course, uh, surface antigen assays are at a limit of 0 0.05. That's the most sensitive assay that we have for use at least commercially at this time, although more super sensitive assays will go down to 0 0.05. This phase two program showed the all oral, uh, six out of 18 patients got to the two log de decline or less than BLQ at week 24, so composite endpoint of 29%. In the combination, or the triple uh, arm with lonafarna boosted with PEG interferon 2 alpha, the composite endpoint was 63%, 5 out of 8, and 78% reached this 2 log de decline or less than BLQ at week 24. So encouraging information. What I'm going to show now is a study that's moving forward uh, globally. There's an all oral arm, which is a lonafarna boosted with ritonavir, triple therapy with PEG interferon alpha 2A a monotherapy arm, and placebo. The placebo has an oral um, uh, uh, placebo, but no uh, sham injections. The comparison will be between the all, all oral and the co triple combination versus placebo. There's a numerical comparison, but not statistical comparison with the monotherapy PEG alpha 2A. This is taking place in North America, Europe, including Turkey. And we have sites in New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, Pakistan, and Mongolia. So truly a global site for, with uh, a number of Delta uh, sites. In the US, we have a hepatitis Delta identification program that's going on with a collaboration with Quest, predominantly also with AREP in Salt Lake City and the Hepatitis B Foundation. 
We think there's about 600,000 diagnosed hepatitis B patients in the U.S. with about 2.2 million that are surface antigen positive and that these HCV patients are clustered in major metro areas. So there's a reflex testing process through Quest that's taking place at this time. They've got over 2,200 sites and this Delta testing program is being uh, advertised and marketed to a number of different uh, providers in the U.S. The Quest uh, test has a threshold of 40 IUs, and this has been published and validated, including against the WHO standards and, and in collaboration with Emmanuel Gordian and his uh, panel that he developed. These are the major hotspots in the US for Delta. This is growing because Delta testing is growing. Uh, under testing is still a huge problem, and there was a nice paper at ACG that also will be shown um, at this meeting, uh, sorry, at, at ASLD and also at HEPDART, uh, that testing is only about 5% when the guidelines are suggesting to test all people or to, to test high-risk individuals, but uh, very low penetrance of testing. Let's switch to PEG interferon lambda. This is a better tolerated interferon that was developed by Zymogenetics in Seattle starting in about 2002, then moved to BMS for hepatitis B, and now is under the Iger umbrella. It's a first uh, in class type 3 interferon that binds to these specific lambda uh, receptors as similar downstream signaling, although these receptors are concentrated in the liver, probably accounts for less uh, side effects. Lots of data, 3,000 patients, and has comparable activity to uh, interferon alpha or, or better, which we'll show you a little bit of data on that. This is the phase two lambda monotherapy study that was completed and presented at EASL in uh, 2019. And they had a primary endpoint to look at safety tolerability, secondary endpoint, number of patients below LOQ 24 weeks after end of therapy. So let's look at that data at least in just a moment. This is looking at the number of patients that uh, decline over time. Sorry that the uh, y-axis is a little bit off, but it's about an additional one log increase when you go from 120 micrograms to 180 micrograms. This is comparison to alpha 180 that we showed earlier. So this is really important, the week 72 follow-up, and this is showing that five out of 14 had reached the BLQ and four out of 14 were below the limits of detection at week 72. There was a verbal communication from Heiner Wiedermeyer at Easel in 2019 that the follow-up from the HIDIT studies using more sensitive assays such as the RoboGene, 0% uh, of patients were actually delta RNA negative long-term. So I think we really need to be using our most sensitive <laughs> assays and showing uh, the performance characteristics of those assays. So LIFT study, this is a phase two lambda combination study that's ongoing. More of this data will be shown at ASLD, but this is a single arm triple combination with lambda, 180 micrograms, lonafarnib and ritonavir with a follow up data and some further on treatment data will be shown at ASLD. This is a two log reduction in HDV RNA at end of treatment as the primary endpoint, but there'll be histologic data that will be presented later as well compared to baseline and 24 weeks of follow up. This just gives you the data under undetectable, so 37% were undetectable, that's 7 out of 19. An additional 3 out of 19 were below the limits of quantification, so very, very high on-treatment response rate and then off-treatment response rate that will be shown later. So we have a first-in-class development for HDV with multiple options. We have PEG interferon alpha 2A. We have lonafarnib, which may actually be useful as monotherapy in patients with HDV RNA levels that are low at baseline. Uh, under two logs, looks like many of those patients will have a primary response. Then interferon lambda is also pursuing development and approval, and we're looking at combination therapies between interferon, lonafarnib, and ritonavir, and determining optimal treatment durations. We really need 48 weeks. A lot of this data suggesting that 24 weeks may be sufficient. These are all the different team members that helped with this development process, and hopefully I've stayed on time. Thank you, Stephen, Ray, Harry, and the rest of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.